I would now like to welcome Linda Goldman, who is the CTO of Trojan Technologies and a board member of Water Technologies Acceler Acceleration Project, WaterTap, right here from Ontario, from the you know, started by the Ontario Ministry of Economic Development and Innovation. Um, Linda has been with Trojan for 13 years in various roles and enjoys the challenge of bringing internal and external cross-functional teams together to provide innovation, innovative solutions related to water. Um, she uh, is the current board member of WaterTap and we welcome her to the podium. I'd love to hear how she, she, people in Ontario can get involved. Thank you very kindly. Honorable Minister Mutagamba, Rotarians, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not even going to dare to do this without speaking notes. Many of you are experts in building infrastructure in places where the burden of bringing water and sanitation to homes is so very severe for citizens and especially women. I am no expert in these matters and in these places and I will not pretend to be so. What I'd like to share with you today is some of my thoughts around what it takes to bring water to people right here in Canada and how that might be relevant in bringing water to people everywhere. We are, after all, one humanity. In countries like Canada, we like to congratulate ourselves on how advanced we are. In the water space, we'd likely point to water treatment systems and sanitation systems and the positive outcome that this has had on public health. We do not, as a rule, simultaneously talk of the many boil water advisories that exist in Canada on any given day. As an engineer, I'm well aware of how water is treated here, and in fact, with my colleagues at work and in the industry, we like to think that we push the technology envelope of what is possible. Indeed, Ontario companies are well known internationally for innovative water treatment technologies, but let's look at what we do holistically. To provide drinking water in general, we collect copious quantities of raw waters from underground aquifers or surface waters like lakes or rivers. We pump it to a centralized location where we do our best to clean it thoroughly by filtering it and then disinfecting it, and then we usually add a chlorine residual to make sure that the water stays safe in the pipe before we send it off through miles and miles of pipes to factories, schools, and homes. The pipes are sized for fighting fires, not for drinking water. And along the way, we lose up to 30% of that water in the pipes through leaks before the last tap, the furthest from the supply, gets the pristine water with the regulated amount of chlorine residual. In our homes, we send liters of this beautiful water directly to the drain as we chat while the faucet is on and we brush our teeth. We water our lawns, we wash our cars, and we clean up the doggy doo. We bathe and we do the laundry, and sometimes we even drink this water and we use it for cooking. In these ways, we use as much water per capita as any jurisdiction in the world. Aren't we advanced? Now, having used a tiny portion of this water to have made dinner, we enjoy our dinner, and a few hours later, we generate liquid and solid biomass that is really not that much different chemically from the food that we started with. Oh, it appears very different. But the basic chemical constituents are not much changed, and so this biomass has all of the nutrients required for growing things. Phosphorus for plant growth is a key ingredient that comes to mind, and for the generation of biogases like methane or hydrogen gas. Indeed, it could have value if we harvested it. Now what do we do? We flush it right down the toilet. We take enormous quantities of this beautiful drinking water and a little bit of concentrated biomass, and we make wastewater. We soil the water and dilute the biomass until the whole thing can only be seen as waste, waste, water. We send it through miles and miles of pipes to a central wastewater treatment plant where we collect it all up, do all kinds of things to undo what we just did. We use space and a significant amount of energy to remove the biomass from the water to concentrate the biomass and clean the water. Now we dare to call this whole process a but really, is it? And when one thinks about it from a holistic perspective, it starts to look a little bit silly. Except that we really don't have a better way. And this whole process, however energy, space, and resource intensive, has given us substantially improved public health, even if I suspect this is not a sustainable paradigm as we continue to populate our world ever more densely. 
Buried in what appears to be the silliness is the potential and the need for change, and hence the drivers for business opportunities. The water and wastewater treatment sectors are changing, even within North America, as municipalities and industries reconsider what they're doing in terms of energy cost, space premiums, water shortages, chronic contamination, advances in technologies that make the reuse of wastewaters, even to the state of direct potable reuse, technically and economically feasible. Wastewater becomes a, re a resource, not a waste. And conservation measures long overdue are implemented. Of course, many experts are thinking along these more holistic lines, and the work of the Gates Foundation in funding research on waterless toilets is, I think, a marvelous example of people working together on a very significant project that may have major impl implications for sanitation health and the sustainable use of water everywhere, and yes, Ontarians are participating. <coughs> In the development of new technologies, Ontario companies have played their roles. The Ontario, two Ontario companies have been recognized with the prestigious Stockholm Industry Water Award for membrane filtration and UV water treatment. Ontario companies reduce leakage and distribution lines, listen for leaks on pipes so that small problems can be fixed, monitor and measure water quality online and in real time, and so on. Ontario academic institutions provide scientific expertise and training of process experts. The Ontario government, through legislation and the development of special programs within the ministries of the environment and economic development and innovation, WaterTap, the Ontario Clean Water Agency, and together with the federal government, with the Southern Ontario Water Consortium are putting in place the infrastructures required to further facilitate the development, testing, and implementation of new technology and process innovations in Ontario, as Ontario companies look to hone their expertise and provide it to the world. But innovation isn't just about technology. In fact, innovation is about people. Speaking for a moment as the Chief Technology Officer of Trojan Technologies, a water treatment company that I work for, we have found in our interactions worldwide, and we have more than 7,000 municipal installations worldwide, that local ownership of the problem and solution is key to a good outcome. It's often said that all water problems are local problems, and from a functional perspective, I do believe this to be true. A place interested in improving its water infrastructure needs support from its local citizens. What wonderful examples. This support includes knowledge, education, communication, the will to act, the will to invest, to persevere, to maintain, and the means to do it all. It requires not just technology, but know-how, not just money, but technical, financial, economic, legal, and compliance know-how over a long term. Indeed, when the community needs to be fully invested in all the requirements, and when that doesn't happen, we have poor outcomes. And unfortunately, we have an Ontario example. Many of you will remember Walkerton, the small town in Ontario, where seven people died and more than a thousand people were made sick when the town's drinking water became contaminated with the pathogenic strain of E. coli. The key to note here is that there was treatment technology in place, but it wasn't working. There were operators and a system in place, and we discovered through careful examination that this wasn't working either. Technology failed, people failed, a system failed, People became ill and some died. You might conclude that as citizens we had become complacent around the whole water treatment process and that we had become complacent around ensuring that the whole system, all parts of it, were in good order. The point is that simply installing technology isn't enough. You need to have a long-term plan with resourcing and follow-up to ensure that a system continues to be robust. I think I heard that earlier too. I believe this is true internationally, even for some of the largest municipalities, where the same challenges of budgeting, maintenance, operator training, and even the philosophical bent of a jurisdiction toward ownership and costing can substantially impact the quality of water delivered and treated. Where we find we have the best outcomes is where locals are engaged, personally invested, in a solution right for them, invested for a long time and for the long term. It is on this front that the need for innovation on non-technical issues is possibly more important than the need for new technologies. Some people think that if we just had a suitable technology innovation, it would change the availability of, world water, of water worldwide, and on this I think I disagree. Even if I had a magic wand to wave over water and clean it instantly, 
The limiting challenge is that water needs to be moved from where it is, um, from where it is to where it's needed, and the water is very heavy. Moving water takes a lot of energy, and there's nothing techn technological that you can do about that, except harvesting rainwater, and that's quite genius. You can use less water, but you still need to move it. As a point of reference here in North America, in California, pumping water uses more electricity than any other process, including the sum of all of the processes used for treating all of their water, some of it to reuse standards. In bringing water to all of the world's people, we in industry are trying to be helpful, but we don't know how to do it. We know how to clean water, and we know how to move it, but we don't know how to bring clean water to all people. Not sustainably, we don't know how to do it sustainably, sustainably, and we don't know how to do it for the long term. Our technology expertise does not help us with this bigger challenge. That is our human challenge. This isn't an easy challenge, and it will require the collaboration of us all. In this regard, Rotary is well-placed, and perhaps even uniquely well-placed, to bring the long-term vision, commitment, local understanding and investment fiscally and in people to make a substantial difference in bringing water to the world. Those of us who do not understand issues in faraway places have much to learn. And one learned, hopefully, we also have something to contribute.